and I want to say it started how many years ago? So anybody who read that, as someone who stands on her soapbox here and is like, no spoilers! I was my own worst enemy in that! So, back it up, if you don't know. So they, like, disappear into the mist, in theory. I'm not giving anything away, don't worry. <laughs> There's not mist that people disappear into. Or is there? Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome or welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today we are going to be talking about the books that I read in June and I know this is like crazy late. So it's the end of July when I'm filming this. So this isn't even one of those like, oh, I filmed it weeks ago and I'm just getting around to it. I'm just getting around to filming it because life. It's just been crazy the last couple of weeks. So I'm super behind as you've probably noticed with lack of content and all the things. But here I am talking about what I read in the month of June. Now I know I normally do these in two parts because I have so much to say, so I'm going to attempt to reel it in a little bit and not be too super chatty, which is helped by the fact that the first two books I have I already talked about ad nauseum in a different video. So the first two books are The Weight of Lies by Emily Carpenter and then The Mist by Ragnar Jonasson. So these were two of the three books that I read for my five star predictions, which I did with Sarah and Lindsay for Bookless Thursday. So I will link that whole video for you guys so you can see my full response to this and my full response, my full review of these. But long story short, I liked but didn't love The Weight of Lies. I thought this was gonna be more Home Before Dark by Riley Sager. So we have in this one, a woman named Meg, and she is reformed party girl, life of privilege. Her mom is a best-selling author of this cult horror book, Kitty, that came out 40 years ago. And in present day, Meg winds up looking into kind of the origin story of that book and what inspired her mom to write that book and the true crime real case behind that book. So I thought it was gonna be like all sorts of deliciousness and it was like just okay. Again, liked it, didn't love it. There was kind of like an online blog element. It was a text message that I wish there would have been more of. And there were parts I liked, but I found parts of it I need to silence everything. I found parts of it more distracting from like the main story or like unnecessary or kind of like dragged on more. So like, it was okay. Not my favorite, it was okay. And a favorite five star though is The Mist by Ragnar Jonasson. And this is the third in the Dark Iceland series or the Holda series as some people know it as. So I'm not gonna go too much into plot anyway because it is book number three. This entire series, I would say, is five stars. Book number one, The Darkness, five stars. Number two, The Island, I gave four. And then this one, I also gave five stars to. So I thought it did a tremendous job of having stories which were conceived as a trilogy, a trilogy that is told in reverse. So we meet Holda, who is a detective inspector. We meet her later in her police career. And the way everything ties together, the entire story, and then each book has a crime in it as well that is part of the investigation is just outstanding. So these are the first and only books I've read so far by Ragnar Jonasson, but I have since purchased everything that he has written to date. And I will be diving into more and more of his things, but found this one to be just really, really great, just okay. And again, if you want like all the thoughts and feelings, check out my five-star prediction wrap-up video, which was above, and it's also be, it will also be down below. Okay, let's talk about one I haven't talked about on here yet, and that's Girl 11 by Amy Suter Clark. So I absolutely loved this book as well, and I feel like I mentioned it in passing in another video, and if you follow me on Instagram, then you would have seen I did a review on Instagram about it. But this was recommended to me by Lindsay from Lindsay's Little Library, and she had kind of compulsively read this a few months back, and she was like, you would love this book. So of course I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't even need to know anything else. I knew it was a thriller and I knew it was kind of messed up, so I was totally signed up for it. So I did a combination of physically reading this book and then doing the audiobook because this has a true crime podcast element and it is so well done. So there's a cast of characters. I'm gonna read their names for you guys. Andy Arndt, Jonathan Davis, Christine Havam, I wanna say, H-V-A-M, and Diana Doan were the four narrators of this. So we get such a well-produced, true crime podcast element, which totally reminded me of Sadie in that way. I thought I snoozed this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so back to the book. So in this one, like I said, we have true crime podcast and I'm always hesitant to like give too much away. And this is definitely a case of, I feel like 
they gave you way too much in the front flap. So I'm just gonna read you the small beginning part of the All You Need to Know, which is we are following a woman named El Castillo, and she used to be a social worker supporting young victims of violent crime, and now she has a popular true crime podcast that focuses on cold cases of missing or murdered children. So this book takes place in Minnesota, and Elle has chosen The Countdown Killer as the case that she is exploring for her new season of her podcast. So The Countdown Killer, or TCK, was someone who came onto the scene 20 years ago, and he would kidnap and murder girls. And there is like a structure to it and a timeline to it, but why he is called The Countdown Killer is because the first person was 20 years old, and then each girl afterwards is one year younger, so 20, 19, 18, 17, and it's sort of the countdown, and then he stopped. And it is one of these cases where the police thinks it's solved, Elle does not believe that it is solved, and she is committed to finding out what happened then. And suffice to say, someone is not so happy that she's poking into this case. So I thoroughly enjoyed this book. This was one of those books that I definitely got lost in, and I was kind of like trying to figure out things as we went along with Elle as she was trying to piece together the evidence. But at the same time, I was also getting just super lost in the story. So I highly recommend this one. I highly recommend the audio. And like I said, I went back and forth. So what I mostly wound up doing is reading the points of view where it's just the book and then listening to the podcast part of it. Or I would be on a walk and I would just be listening to the whole thing because I wanted to be in it but I thought it was really smart. I thought it was really well done. I really enjoyed Elle as a character. I think there's a great cast of characters. I feel like there's really strong conflict and motivations and just real humanity and understanding to the characters in this book, but I just thought it was really, really great, really smart. I definitely will be reading more from Amy Suter Clark. So this is her debut and I don't know, I need to look into seeing what she has coming out next or what she might be working on, but highly recommend just such a great read. So thanks, Lindsay. The next book I talked about when I did a thriller recommendation video, and this is None Shall Sleep by Ellie Marnie. So reading this book sort of inspired me to do that in the sense that this was such a great thriller that I kind of didn't see coming. And it just inspired me to make another video about a bunch of thrillers that I love for you guys. So again, I will link that one in all the places too. But this is a YA thriller, though I would say it really leans adult in some ways in terms of like, it was way more violent than I had expected which I mentioned in my other my other book, my other video also. And also our main characters are 18 and 19. So I feel like we're sort of, even though they're like teen, it sort of veers into that new adult, young adult, like beyond young adult. Anyway, this is not light YA. This is definitely dark and messy YA and has major Silence of the Lambs vibes to it. So that in and of itself should sort of like give you a bit of a hint about how dark and messy it gets, I would say. So this takes place in 1982, which I loved, I absolutely loved, and we're in Quantico. So we have two teenagers, serial killer survivor Emma Lewis and U.S. Marshal candidate Travis Bell, who are recruited by the FBI to interview teen serial killers. So the FBI is trying to get information out of these juvenile killers, but no shock, the killers don't really want to talk to these FBI dudes and dudettes, and they wind up sort of kind of like The Naturals by Jennifer Lynn Barnes, recruiting these teenagers who they think can have an in with these juvenile killers and get some information behind their motivations and just sort of like all the details. So of course the whole idea is that Emma and Travis are gonna work on cold cases and killers who are in prison and interviewing them in prison, but of course they get pulled into a somewhat active case that's going on and things get dangerous and very, very messy. And it involves Emma having to work with this behind bar serial killer who is sort of our Hannibal Lecter of it all. And his name is Simon Gutmanson. And he is a teenage sociopath and the most, in, no, most notorious, can you tell I haven't filmed in forever? I'm sure you can. Most notorious incarcerated murderers. So he does all kind of like the mind games and really gets to Emma and messes with her and it's just so well done. I said it in my other video, I of course haven't done it yet. I meant to read Silence of the Lambs earlier this year, like I had a plan to read it earlier this year and then 
I get so moody, I just didn't read it. And after I read this, I was like, oh, I totally need to read Silence of the Lambs soon. So I totally still need to read Silence of the Lambs soon, which I haven't done yet, but I've seen the movie a couple of times. So I just thought this was really, really well done. And like I said, it went so much darker and bloodier than I had expected from a YA book. And I think that's just my own ignorance about things, but I really enjoyed it. I read it really quickly. I was totally hooked by this book. So I would highly recommend it. I thought the story was great. I enjoyed the twists and turns. I really loved Emma and Travis's characters. There is a slew of supporting adult cast to this as well. And I just thought they were really great characters, just really strong. And I just loved just twists and turns. I liked her writing style, just all of it. I had such a good time with this book. So if you are looking for a YA, but on the darker side, I would definitely recommend Nunchal Sleep. And then for a completely lighter, complete 180, I read The Bling Ring by Nancy Jo Sales. So I have had this book for a while and I have had, I have such a fascination with like celebrity gossip and scandal and all of that good stuff. So this is based on the thefts that happened to a bunch of celebrities. I wanna say, was this like 10 or 15 years ago? 2010. And no, a lie between 2008 and 2009. So it was like Audrina Patridge and Orlando Bloom and Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton. And it's these like super celebs with these super mansions that were getting robbed, Rachel Bilson from the OC. And it turns out that it was a group of high school students basically who were breaking into their homes and stealing their stuff. And it's like crazy. Like I feel like you cannot make this stuff up. And this book is based on a Vanity Fair article that Nancy Jo Sales wrote, and it was called The Suspects Wear Louboutins. So she wrote this article, and then Sofia Coppola, the director, wound up calling her and said that she wanted to turn this into a movie. And then I feel like this book happened either simultaneously or after the fact, but this book does a deeper dive into the crimes, the people who are accused of it, and it gives some really, really interesting kind of social commentary on the time and sort of the obsession with celebrity and teenagers and just, I found it all really, really fascinating and what a kind of like social impact this crime had on sort of pop culture and society and just sort of, just the insanity that they even got away with this. It's absolutely crazy. So, I found this very, very fascinating. I wound up doing a little bit of a combination of this as well, of mostly audiobook and then reading some of it. And I don't know how to describe just why I find it so fascinating, but they got away with stealing, it says more than $3 million in clothing, jewelry, shoes, and handbags. And it's literally just like these regular kids and they, would go out to clubs and they would post themselves like on Facebook and MySpace, like wearing their, like Paris Hilton's vest or Rachel Bilson's necklace or like whatever it was. And they broke into, it was supposed to be for Megan Fox, but it's when she was married to Brian Austin Green. And they wound up like stealing a gun and like all this other stuff. And they would like party at Paris's house, like great, like audacity. And <laughs> I just can't even believe it. And it was like these celebrities would be out of town. So they would follow as you could do where the celebrities were and then they would go to their house and they would just they wouldn't even like break in in the sense of like doors were unlocked and alarm systems weren't latched so so many of these celebrities i think sort of lived in this like false sense of security and nobody was home at the time when they did it but it's really just absolutely nuts so i found it really really fascinating and again i really find kind of her commentary on things she winds up following the criminal case, them going to the jury, sentencing, like all those other kinds of things, and sort of who was the ringleader, who was behind it. And what's also really interesting is one of the people who was accused, this girl, Alexis Nyers, and I wanna say maybe she was like a senior in high school. During the time that this, I think it like started before, but overlaps with, they were filming this e-reality show, Pretty Wild. I don't know if anybody remembers that show. It lasted for one season. But in the show, she winds up getting arrested and her court date and all of that plays out on the show. So it's just like life imitating art and reality and like all the blurred lines and like all the weirdness of it all. I just found it completely fascinating. So what I will say is 
I then watched the Sofia Coppola film, which I was really curious about, and Emma Watson is kind of the big name in that, and I was really disappointed in the movie. I feel like it could have been so much better, and there were moments of it that were fun slash interesting, but I really feel like it missed the mark and did not at all capture the real story of it all. But it was interesting to see afterwards, but the book is so much better. And if you've seen the movie and you're kind of like, whatever, this book goes into like, obviously much more detailed detail behind how they did it, what they did, why they kind of targeted who they did and just sort of the insanity that was the lives of these teenagers before it happened and how their parents had no idea. I mean, it just was, was really, really good. So I'm so glad I finally read it, long story short. And if you're looking for a good nonfiction to just get lost into and you love sort of all that pop culture-y stuff, like I said, 2008, 2009, this is definitely a great one to read. The next book I have is a reread. So I reread The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager before I did my Riley Sager Spotlight video. So again, if you have seen that video, you will hear me talk all about this. So I will refer you over there to save you some time. And, or I'm gonna save some time here so you can hear my in-depth thoughts over there. But long story short, I read this when it came out and I had, if you guys have been here for a minute, you know this story. I read Final Girls first. I totally fell in love with Riley Sager. It was a five-star read and anything after that was gonna be a disappointment. And I did not, I liked but didn't love this book the first time I read it. And I actually gave it three stars on Goodreads. And I went back and read that Goodreads review and I don't know what snit I was in, but I was like harsher than harsh. I also, shame on me, gave away spoilers in my review without blinding it and marking it spoilers. So anybody who read that, as someone who stands on her soapbox here and is like, no spoilers, I was my own worst enemy in that. I have since cleaned it up and deleted parts of it. And there's just, I, I don't know, I just, I like, I like dug in on one particular point, which was so silly, or I don't know, I guess I just really was feeling it at the time. But I have to say, second time around, I really loved it. And I don't know what I was thinking. I don't even know if you can see, it's like dog-eared a ton. I just loved it. And the first time I read this, I actually had the ebook from my library, so I didn't have a physical book, so this is the first time I'm marking it up. And I really compulsively read this and I was just sort of like, why didn't I love this the first time around? But I do think Final Girls was just, nothing was gonna match that for me. But this is the Summer Camp Riley Sager book. So we have dual timelines and this one takes place at Camp Nightingale. So we have these three teenage girls who are in a cabin and their fourth roommate winds up being this girl who shows up late to camp, who is our main character, Emma. And Emma just really wants to fall in with these girls and Vivian is their ringleader and she wants to be accepted by them and go out with them and she's sort of mesmerized by them with Vivian in particular. So one night the three older girls are leaving, kind of sneaking out of the cabin and Emma wants to go with them and Vivian's like, you're too young, you have to stay here, you can't come with us. And the girls are never seen from again. So left that night, never found, mystery is never solved and this in and of itself took that camp down because obviously you lose three campers. It's not really good for business. So then when the book opens and we're 20 years later, the owner of the camp is trying to reopen it and she asks Emma to come back along with a few other people, this time as a teacher, Emma is a super famous artist and she believes that Emma being there will help legitimize the camp as being safe and it like sort of attract more people to come back to it. And Emma wants to go back because all these years she has been haunted by Vivian and the other two girls and she needs to know what happened. And she of course blames herself for part of what happened. So we wind up doing the dual timelines and it just was so much fun. So this is a perfect summertime book if you're looking for a summer book. It's such great Riley Sager. He's just, you guys know, he's absolutely one of my faves. And I, take back what I said in my Goodreads review, because as much as I did like it, I loved it so much more this time around. So highly recommend calling myself wrong. And yeah, you should definitely read this one. The next book I read is The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. I did mostly the audiobook of this as well, like 90% audiobook of this. And it is narrated by Hugh Fraser, and it's just so wonderful. So this is a Poirot book. This is the fourth book in the Poirot series. And this is one of those books that I think thought I had been spoiled for it. And it turns out I was. Like I remember being spoiled for 
some of her books in a TV show that I was watching, just sort of like characters talking in passing during a, it was a crime thriller mystery TV show. I don't want to ruin it for anybody. And they were comparing the case to different Agatha Christie books and like talking about endings of them. So this was one of those books that again, so many people talk about and I was like, I need to read it because it's a thousand percent spoiled in Eight Perfect Murders by Peter Swanson. And again, I'm trying to read some of the books that are spoiled in that that I actually care about before I read Eight Perfect Murders. And while I was reading this, probably halfway through, I was like, oh, I totally think this is what happens in this book. And I was right, but it did not diminish my enjoyment of the book because Agatha Christie is amazing. So in this book, based on the title, you know, Roger Ackroyd is murdered. So it says Roger Ackroyd knew too much. He knew that the woman he loved had poisoned her brutal first husband. He suspected that someone had been blackmailing her. Then tragically came the news that she had taken her own life with a drug overdose. But the Evening Post brought Roger one last fatal scrap of information. Unfortunately, before he could finish reading the letter, he was stabbed to death. So I thought this was so clever. And even knowing the final reveal of this book, the how, the... Does anyone know how to silence messages? My volume is off on this. I know, turn it off, right? Turn off your iPad. That's what you're gonna tell me. But I need to know who's narrating my books. So even though I knew the ending of this book, I have to say the getting there, Poirot's investigation, the suspects, the how, the who, the why, <laughs> like the when, all of the things are still just completely enjoyable. And I really enjoy her as a writer. I have not read a fraction of her books, but I like to get lost in them. I very much enjoy them. I'm kind of slowly, you know, getting into them here and there and trying to like pepper them in as I'm reading and, or as I'm reading, pepper them into other books as I'm, pepper them into my reading list. Oh my goodness, you guys, I'm sorry. But this one was just really, really good. And she's clever. I never would have figured it out on my own. I'm, I don't feel like I'm ever smart enough to figure out an Agatha Christie book, but I just very much enjoyed this. I'm glad I read it. I kind of feel like I'm like in on it now. And when people talk about this book, I understand. And like I said, even knowing the ending did not diminish the rest of the reading experience, but the audiobook is great. I really enjoy her books on audio as well. And I find it fun looking for clues or thinking back. And like I said, even though I won't always, like how Poirot connects those dots with the little gray cells, I don't know. But I had such a great time with it. And I've really been sort of on a little bit of a kick with Agatha Christie and that she's showing up in other books. I will talk about this when I do my July wrap up. I read The Agathas by Kathleen Lawson. Kathleen Gleason and Liz Lawson, which has a lot of Poirot, Agatha Christie references in it, hence the name The Agathas and a whole bunch of other stuff, which was just great. So I very much enjoyed kind of reading this and then reading that and just kind of still being in that world. So anyway, long story short, too late, classic Agatha Christie, can't go wrong, great fun. And then the last book I wanna talk about is Liking Myself Back by J.C. Dupree. So this is also nonfiction, this is memoir, and I, loved this book you guys i i feel like you won't even be able to tell i actually used those book darts which i bought a while ago and i kind of just like didn't want to use them on like any old book it's these metal darts rather than the tabs which i was using in hold please dropped a book like other than like the tabs that i'm using in other books you'll hear about this one in july too but i saved my book darts for this one and i darted <laughs> like the heck out of this book. I feel like you're not even gonna be able to tell. Can you? It's not gonna focus. I always do that. Anyway, so many quotable lines, so many relatable elements to this. So in case you don't know, JC Dupree is the founder, CEO of Damsel and Dior, which started out as a little fashion blog, just really kind of tracking the outfits she was wearing and has grown into this entire company. And I wanna say maybe she started her blog in like 2008-ish, I wanna say it was. So she had worked at E, she had had some other jobs too. And I have followed her since what I feel like is the beginning. Like I remember stumbling upon her blog and just really loving her style, loving her aesthetic, her approach to sort of her personality and have followed her all these years. And I find it so interesting because obviously this book peels back the curtain and 
kind of the whole irony of it all, you know, is just sort of you're showing this lifestyle and how great and how perfect and how curated and all these great things. And then nothing is as it seems, which is sort of like the obvious. We are also having a massive rainstorm. So if you're hearing the rain hitting the window, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, cannot do anything about the rain. But anyway, back to the book. So I have followed her entire journey and it was so interesting because so much of what she has done is obviously on Instagram, was on her blog. She also has a bunch of videos on YouTube where she was tracking trips she was taking to Paris or to different fashion weeks, New York, these great trips that she was being sent on. So to see all of that again, sort of with a new lens on it, and she peels back such a vulnerable layer and talks about everything from mental health to her father's alcoholism, their struggles, which I feel like she was pretty transparent about with getting pregnant and fertility and what a challenging pregnancy she had had and things that she had not shared before, which is that her and her husband had actually separated kind of when she was in the peak of her career and how her career really took over and threatened her her losing her friendships, losing her marriage, how she was really alienating different people and how she had kind of turned into this person that she didn't like anymore. And really interesting about, you know, like it's called liking myself back and how she was always looking for that validation and became obsessed with it. And sort of you can understand that culture of how it becomes obsessive and how people really cling to the likes and the follows and how it, comes to mean so much more than anything else for a lot of people. So I found it a really powerful, really interesting book. I was crying at certain parts. I was really moved by certain parts. It's really interesting. She has a series on her YouTube channel, which is all still up, called Home Sweet Damsel. Her husband was a real estate developer, so they would renovate houses. So not even like renovate to flip, like renovate, live in them. So it's really interesting to hear again what was going on here behind the scenes versus what you're seeing on YouTube. So just a really interesting comment, you know, just sort of on this, you know, as someone who, like I'm not saying I'm her, but someone who is putting out content and I'm not naive enough to think that everything we see online is real and that, you know, we know we're all seeing the highlight reels of people and we're seeing the best of things, but to really just have no idea what is going on behind the scenes with people, I just found it really interesting and just, I really appreciated her, her honesty and her transparency in this book. I don't know if I connected with it more as someone who has followed her journey or if I really feel like anybody could appreciate this and appreciate what she is sharing in here and the struggles with her family and her parents and just the complete raw open honesty of this book. I read this in like two days my library has the audiobook of it, which she narrates it, which because I'm obsessive and because I want to hear it again, I'm definitely going to borrow that and listen to that as well because I'm just really curious to hear it in her voice. And I thought it was great. So I highly recommend this. I know a few people sort of had commented when I had mentioned this book. I don't know if I showed it to you guys in a haul or if I just talked about it when it was coming out in June, but I, I just thought it was absolutely great. I loved it so, so much and I think there's inspiration in here. I think there's lessons to glean in here. I think there's real relatability. And there's also just some fun fashion, super cool stuff that she got to do. And it's really just, it's really, really fun. So I just thought it was great all around. And I really, like I said, I really appreciated the pulling back of the curtain on things and kind of pictures are not what they seem or certain things that you like very deliberately showing you to cover up what was really going on. So again, things that are obvious in that sense, but at the same time, I just really enjoyed it and thought it was great. So for anyone who's asking, I highly recommend this book. I loved it, five stars, absolutely. Okay, so that was probably much more long-winded than I had planned, but that's everything that I read in June. So I hope you guys had good reading months in June. I'm sorry again, this is so late, but I still wanted to get it out to you guys. But let me know if you read any of these, what you read in June, what you loved, or what you're reading now since I'm 100 years late for the month of June. But <laughs> thanks for sticking with me, you guys. Thanks for being here today and hanging out. And I will see you guys in another video soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.